Good afternoon and welcome to our final financial literacy seminar of the semester. So I'm Christine Dobridge and I'm an economist at the Federal Reserve Board and we are very pleased today to host Professor Paige Marta Skiba this afternoon. Uh, professor Skiba is a professor of law and a professor of economics at Vanderbilt University. Her current research focuses on the causes and consequences of borrowing on high interest credit, such as payday loans, auto title loans, and pawn shops. She has published in numerous economics and law journals, including the Review of Economics and Statistics, the American Law and Economics Review, uh, AEJ Applied Economics, and the Journal of Law and Economics. Professor Skiba also serves on the board of the American Law and Economics Association and the Society for Empirical Legal Studies. She completed her PhD in economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and today she will be presenting her work, Regulation on the Margin, Evidence from Online Payday Lending. So just a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, we would ask that you please put any of your questions into the Q&A box and not the chat window. And I'm gonna be moderating these questions during the talk. Uh, the presentation will wrap up at about 4.15 and we will also have extra time at the end for questions. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over. Thank you. Does that look and sound okay? Looks yes. good, yes. Okay, well, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Andrea and Hannah for inviting me and organizing this great event. This is a paper that I've really wanted to get feedback on. It's been kind of kicking around for a while, but this is perfect timing for me um, for this project. I hope to work on this more this summer. I'll be talking about what I call regulating on the margin, these kind of sm small, small rules that states enforce against payday lending or other types of small dollar credit um, and how they impact the online payday loan industry and its borrowers. This is joint work with another Paige, Paige Anders, who's a PhD student at Vanderbilt University. So I live and breathe payday loans. I'm sure many people on this meeting are very familiar with small dollar high interest credits. So let me just take one minute to set ideas here and tell us how payday loans and the online payday loan industry works. So payday loans are very expensive, small, short-term credit. So a typical loan is a few hundred dollars. I'll be talking about data from Tennessee where the maximum loan amount you can get is $425. The average is more like 360 or so. And the fees and interest rates are extraordinarily high. So in a typical payday loan transaction, uh, you will show the payday lender your most recent uh, pay stub, your banking details. Um, payday lenders won't do a traditional credit uh, check or look at your credit bureau reports. But if you borrow, say, $360, you will owe probably $40 in interest on your next payday. So if that's a couple weeks away, you'll owe $400 that 360 plus the original 40 in a couple of weeks. So the annualized interest rates are easily in the three, four to 450 percent. So this is about as expensive kind of credit as you can get. And rolling over your loans is extremely common. Um, the CFPB uh, has written a couple of reports on this practice where, you know, 80, something like 80 percent of payday loans are rolled over, meaning you don't actually, the borrower isn't able to pay that $400 in full on their next payday. They just pay the $40 in interest and they roll over the rest of the loan till the following payday, at which time they will owe an additional bout of interest. So this is really, despite what payday lenders advertise that these are loans meant to help short, very short term, a couple week cash shortages, they typically, you know, people use these loans for weeks or months at a time. And they have been they're banned in um, about half of the states. And among the other 26 states, there's been very active uh, state level regulation. And there is a long line of research studying the consequences of payday lending. I know many people who are, who I've talked to today or who on this, on this call, like Kabir, Neil have written really influential work in this area. So part of my research agenda here is just to uncover what effect payday loans serve, what effect they have on borrowers and how they serve low-income households. So 
Today, I'll be talking about online payday lending, which essentially works the same way. The process I outlined earlier was for a storefront payday lender where you would typically write a personal check for that $400. Um, in the online context, this is it works very similar, except you're going to have to upload um, electronic versions of your ID, your bank statement, et cetera. And um, the payday, you'll get, you'll receive your um, payday loan electronically, and the lender will try to electronically, um, they'll ACH your bank account on your next payday. So if, to learn more about the process, for this paper, I took out a payday loan at the lender that I will be talking about the data. This is their website. I got $425, which is the maximum in Tennessee. I had to pay back, this was an expensive um, little detour into my research, $75 in interest. So I owed them $500 on my next payday. I get paid monthly. This was about a three week loan. So it was that $75 interest was about 17% fee annualized, that would be about 300% APR. So think of the online lending, lending industry as working um, essentially the same as storefront. And in fact, most payday lenders do both um, options. So just to sort of nest this into our financial literacy seminar and to also talk to you a little more about what I mean about regulation, regulating at the margin in light of all this research I've talked about trying to figure out are payday loans good or bad for people. It turns out they're kind of mixed. And I think that my message today will be that of all the high interest, small dollar credit, payday loans might be the best one. They're simple, easy to understand. And all these efforts that states have attempted to make them safer have only channeled borrowers into worse credit products. And you see that the kind of regulating at the margin has taken everything from just increased information disclosures, minimum length on the um, maturation period of the loan. So instead of two, one pay cycle, two, limiting rollovers and capping loan amounts, which is what I'm going to talk about today. So to preview the results, um, I use administrative records from one large payday lender, and we're going to use what's called a regression kink design to study the effect of capping the loan size that borrowers can get from you know, 425, that is the state max in Tennessee, to much lower. Um, and if you're not, you know, here I wanna be a little bit cautious because if you're familiar with regression kink design or more popular is the sister regression discontinuity design, regression kink design is one that really requires a lot of data to get precise estimates. And that's something that we're not afforded here. So we're gonna be a little bit cautious about how, how much conclusions we draw from this work, but I think the, the effect sizes are interesting, but I think more importantly, the direction of the results and um, the, the, the sign of the results and what they point to, I think are interesting, but we'll be cautious on this design. So we find first, the first stage of this um, regression kink I'll describe, will tell us how much people are borrowing out of what they've been offered. And we'll find that the online payday loan customers are more highly credit constrained than any other um, estimates I've seen in the literature. We'll also find that capping loan sizes around this $525 max may actually lead to increased future borrowing. So it seems that people, when they need a payday loan, that they would like to borrow potentially more than $525 and that uh, capping how much they borrow may actually sort of perversely create increased interest payments and extended periods of indebtedness for them. So we find that you know, being constrained by $50 in how much you borrow today leads to several hundred dollars increased borrowing over the next six months. And we also don't find large effects on delinquency, late payments, or default, which sort of surprised me. That was the direction we had started going in for this project was to look at um, default rates. So let me explain to you our empirical strategy very simply. And for the interest of time, I won't go into a ton of detail on the econometrics, but I'm happy to answer more questions later. But what we're gonna do is use this confluence of state laws with the firm, the payday, online payday lending firms underwriting rules, which will create a kink in the offer amounts. 
for online payday lenders. So in Tennessee, I already mentioned that the maximum amount of payday loan you can get is $425. Combine that with the fact that this firm, their underwriting rules state that they offer about 2% of annual income or 25.5% monthly income. Those are the same thing. So what that means is that for any income above $20,000, 25.5% or 2.125% of 20,000 is going to be 425, which means any income above $20,000 is not gonna get you an extra dollar of loan offered. So if you make $21,000, you'll get 425 offer if you make 25,000, et cetera. But below that, you are going to get action on how much income affects the loan offer. And so there's a change in slope, which I think is easiest to see here in this theoretical offer curve. And so what you see here are just simply plotted, oops, is annual income against the loan size and what you'll see here is this slope of, you know, 25.5% of monthly income or 2.125% uh, of annual income increasing. So this slope, and then everyone above $20,000 is going to be offered 425. So what we're going to do is use this change in slope, sort of analogous to a regression discontinuity, where we explo exploit a change in the treatment around a discontinuity, we're going to explo exploit this change in slope to understand the effect that larger loans have on borrowers. So I think the next thing I want to show you is just really the raw data on how income is related to loan size. Um, let me show you this figure first. And so there's a, a bunch to unpack here. So first I've replicated that theoretical offer curve of you know the slope of 2.125% leading up to 20,000, capping out at 425 for those making 20,000 and above. The green line here, the dots here are the average kind of bend income by loan size values. And then the green line is a local linear best fit of those data. So what you can see here is a few things. First, I say the kink is real, which means that the data are kinked in this way. We're not getting exactly the offer curve that we thought was theoretical. It's not the case that people take every cent that's offered to them, but they are influenced by the offer curve as evidenced by this green line. Second, and very importantly, no one's getting above $425 in loan amounts, so it's nice that the firm is abiding by state law. Third, they're not following their underwriting rules exactly to a T like I would have thought. So this causes some fuzziness in our design. You can see here for people under $20,000, many people are taking loans larger than what I would have expected, which causes some noise in our estimates. So either maybe they have some kind of income they were not able to observe or the payday loan employees are offering people loans larger than they should. What's comforting is that we can, when I talk about the assumptions of our design, that's not really going to matter, but um, it is something to worry about. And you also see, somewhat surprisingly, that despite the fact that I talk about these people being credit constrained, many, many people are not taking 100% of the loan that they're offered. And that's especially, you know, you can, what you see is that more lower income people take the maximum amount that they're offered and less so for people above $20,000. And we'll break our analysis into those lower, the people taking loans closer to the maximum. But so what I want you to take from this is that we do get this kink in the kind of raw data of the first stage. Um, it's not perfect, but it's good enough to move forward in the next step of our empirical design. And so I might just pause here for a second and see if there's some questions, because this is kind of one of our main results. And I'll move on to describe this strategy and more on the second stage in a second. Sure, we do have a couple of questions. So first, is this a lender that only operates 
in Tennessee and are all these individuals, do they all live in, do you have to live in Tennessee to take out this loan? Yeah, so this lender has, operates throughout the Southeast. We have restricted analysis to Tennessee where there's this $425 cap um, and borrowers do have to reside in Tennessee. One thing we mentioned in the paper is that sort of what you often think about is online lending is sort of skirting state level regulation where maybe people are borrowing from, you know, maybe there's a bank abroad or um, underwriting these loans or that um, people, you know, not within the state are borrowing within a state. So from what I can tell everyone, you know, I have data on people's driver's licenses. I see that they live in Tennessee. And so just thinking more about external validity, this is definitely an online payday lender who seems to abide by the rules. Whereas I think many online lenders um, get critiqued for sort of the whole purpose of going online is to skirt state level regulation. And do you know any demographics about these borrowers or what else, do, what do you know about I them? I do, I'll Besides. show, I think my next slide is on um, some of the basics and they the borrowers look pretty similar to what you would see in other high interest, small dollar credit, large majority uh, female, uh, respondents and you know there are many borrowers who make much more than forty thousand that I put here, but we're looking very close to that twenty thousand dollar link. So, okay, thank you. That's all we yeah. have for now. Okay, so what we're going to do here, um, let me just take one second to explain our empirical strategy. Is that when think of. Um, Essentially, what we'll do in our regressions is take the, uh, this estimate of the green line, the kink between the relationship of annual income and loan size and net that out of any other relationship between annual income and our outcomes of interest. And so the how we do that in practice is that we're going to run regressions similar to regression discontinuity, where we're kind of instrumenting for being on one side of the treatment or another. What we'll do here is instrument for loan size by using an indicator of being above that $20,000 threshold interacted with annual income. So you can think of, um, let me think of the best um, way to say this. So you could think that if there's no effect on our treatment, we would not expect a change or a change in slope because annual income is changing smoothly across the threshold. If we see anything else changing in this kind of sloped way, we can, assuming that we believe in our regression kink design, we'll assume that those changes are due to changes in the loan size offered. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this um, if I have time, but it's a sort of weak version of regression discontinuity where there's not a huge change over the $20,000 thresholds. What's changing is the marginal change in dollar of credit offered per dollar of income. So what we're gonna do is look for in the figures and in our regressions, uh, evidence of this change in slope in our outcome variables. And we, you won't be surprised that for borrowers taking close to the maximum, so 95 to 100% of how much they're offered, this figure looks um, sort of much tighter that nearly everyone above 20,000, this is just plotting the sort of raw data, this green line of the change in slope for those borrowers, which we'll be interested in later. So in our first stage regressions, where we're just quantifying how much this kink affects people's borrowing, we find that um, online customers borrow about 57 cents out of every extra dollar that they're offered. And this is higher than other estimates that we've come across. So compared to uh, Fritz Dixon, who looks at auto title lenders about 50%, I have another paper on payday loans that finds about 40, you know, 40 cents on the dollar, several papers on credit cards where we find people borrowing 45 cents on the dollar. And so these are people who are extremely credit constrained. They're borrowing 57 cents more than any other estimate. And again, it is a little strange, right? Because you still, despite this fact that I'm saying they're credit constrained, there are people who are not taking out the maximum amount that they're borrowed. 
But this is what our first stage gets us is this relationship between dollar amount offered and dollar amount taken up. So next we're gonna move on to the meat of the paper where we look for changes in slope at the $20,000 kink among borrower, different borrower outcomes. So at this company, we'll look at, we've got data from this company that offers a number of types of loans. So we'll look at how much people borrowed on any other type of credit and also default delinquency and rollover behavior. So at this firm, they offer, as I said, both online and storefront payday lending online and storefront installment loans, which are somewhat similar to payday loans, but they're larger, so up to $2,000. They last for several weeks and they're cheaper on the face of it. They come with a few fees and they have APRs about 100%. Also on offer at this company are auto title loans. So you have to own your car outright. And so you use your car title to collateralize your loan and the loan offer is based on the resale value of your car. And these are, um, the auto title loans come with pretty hefty interest um, as well. So here's some uh, just very uh, basic data on our paper. So we're gonna use data from January, 2012 to January, 2013 in Tennessee where this cap is binding. You see, we have um, biweekly, bimonthly and monthly borrowers also weekly borrowers, they're not, they're subject to different rules on underwriting. So we're gonna exclude those from our main analysis. But you see the average loan sizes here are about 363. Default rates are low because as I said, people, the, people have given access directly to the banks to um, get their repayment. But delinquency late payment is quite high. So 18 or 19% of borrowers are not repaying their loan on time, which is sort of surprising to me, but I presume many, many bills are awaiting this one payday and only 32% of borrowers are male. And we're, we're left with just 1,251 borrowers who made 10,212 loans in our sample. So that's what our sample looks like. Okay, so on to our results. We look at, again, we're just gonna graph as we did before with the first stage loan size versus annual income, we'll graph our outcome against annual income and be interested in the change in slope at that $20,000 threshold. And if we find changes here in the slope of the outcomes, then we can attribute those to differences in loan size since income is trending through smoothly throughout this whole support of the graph, but we know that loan offers are changing at this Event. And so we don't see a lot of these are a little bit messy. Where we really start to see effects is these strong effects in the total amount borrowed in the next six months or the total amount borrowed next year. And you can see here visually that there is a change in slope increasing at 20,000. And looking at the regression results, we can quantify those to be about if you were. You know, imagine you're between this twenty and thirty thousand dollars. Everyone in that range is getting a four hundred twenty-five dollar loan, no more. So, being kind of constrained in that by say fifty dollars is going to lead you to borrow about six hundred fifteen dollars more in the next six months. So, meaning you were, you know, something about not being able to borrow as much as you wanted affected um, your repayment behavior or sorry, your borrowing behavior in the future and even stronger effects over the following year. And um, these are the regression results we get. So these are, let's just highlight this in the next 12 months, we get this minus $12, meaning we this is being constrained by $1 increases $12 subsequent borrowing, or I multiplied that by 50, which is kind of the average difference between the loan size above and below $20,000. Uh, maybe I'll stop here for a second and I'm gonna move on to talk about some of the uh, robustness checks that we do in other um, results, but there's questions. These are kind of our main findings of increased borrowing based on the fact that you didn't get to borrow as much as you could around the $20,000 kink. 
We do have a couple of a couple of extra questions. So first, do you um, know or if people can take another, or if any of these people are taking another payday loan from a different lender, or do you know anything about the propensity to sort of switch around from different payday lenders, and could that be affecting the results? Excellent question. So it definitely could be affecting the results. Um, we. I won't be able to observe as the econometrician if people are borrowing elsewhere. So I think I can interpret that pretty favorably as these being sort of low, the lower bound on the effects of the, you know, this cap. But that's not to say that there wouldn't be sort of confounding effects. So, you know, we really can only say what's happening at this firm. Um, it's It's possible that people see their loan offer and they don't like it and they go somewhere else. So there's some kind of selection into this firm, but um, that's one big drawback is that we're not able to observe like the full wallet and borrowing and balance sheet of these borrowers. Okay. And can you clarify um, whether this, the income requirement is, is only wage income or whether you, that people are also able to count like UI income or tr other transfer payment type people of People can and do use unemployment insurance or unemployment benefits. They can use social security benefits. Um, more, most typically it's um, traditional work. And we do have, I haven't made much use of those data. We do know um, the source of the income, which I think would be really interesting. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, payday lenders are pretty, open-minded as far as what counts as income, like a payday based on unemployment insurance, where the definition of unemployment insurance is you don't have a job and you wish you did have one. So, yeah. And then um, what does the distribution of income look like the data look like in the data? And, and in particular, is there any evidence that the lender is inflating income in order to uh, be able to offer people larger loans? Yeah, so I'm going to just show that in a second because this is like the key to the empirical strategy is that neither the firm nor the borrower are manipulating their income in a way that would affect these um, outcomes. And just since you brought it up, I'll say that unlike most you know, regression discontinuity designs were like having one more dollar income might get you something really good, some treatment that you wanted, where there <laughs> is an effect on the, where, where you would reasonably think that manipulation of income would be, you know, incentivized here. An extra dollar of income doesn't really get you, it gets you the marginal change in an extra dollar, you know, the small difference in how much you can borrow. So, we think just intuitively there's not a huge incentive for borrowers or for firms or for the firm to manipulate income. And we do see, you know, I do see people's pay stub. Um, the, you know, Steve, I guess we have very robust data here that I've seen collected at the payday lender. So yes, I guess it's theoretically possible that there's something behind these data, but our tests show a lack of manipulation and just sort of common sense suggests it's not a big, you know, a big difference just being to the left or to the right of the king. Mm -hmm. And then um, in your result that shows that people who were constrained ended up borrowing more, uh, borrowing more over time, is that result concentrated for people that chose not to take the full loan amount? Um, um, that, yeah, that's a great question. I guess I don't know if I showed, yeah, the results are definitely the largest for those close to the maximum amount. So you can, and those are the ones who took 95% of their loan off or more, which makes sense that those are the ones who are really in desperate need of some liquidity today. And so that being constrained in how much they can borrow is gonna have these spillover effects into the future. Um, but we could, I think, I don't know in the paper if we do a great job of disentangling the heterogeneity. Part of that is just, we have, we have 1,200 borrowers, so mm -hmm. cutting the data too deep, we get pretty slim cells pretty fast. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's all yeah. we have for right now. Okay, so that tees up perfectly the next couple of slides I'm going to talk about, which is how much should we believe this RK design? Um, and these are, you know, the assumptions are easily tested, just 
Um, so first we have to assume consumers can't perfectly manipulate, manipulate their income. Otherwise we'd be picking up, you know, people just to the right-hand side of the kink may be somehow smarter, more sophisticated. I don't, you know, you could make up a story for how people on either side of the kink might, uh, we're picking up some other treatment effect that's not actually the loan size and also the smoothness of covariate. So we wanna make sure that the type of people, you know, forgetting about manipulation for a second, but that the type of people on either side of the, the kink line that $20,000 or some more. And what we find is first on covariate balance, we have a bunch of information about people. The figures here are small, but we know their um, how long they've lived at their residence, their job tenure, their pay frequency, even information from their driver's license, such as their hair color. And for all these outcomes, we don't find um, evidence of uh, imbalance and covariates right around that $20,000 mark. And we also don't find evidence of bunching or this manipulation in income. And so here we're inspired by the McCreary test using regression discontinuities where we can, this is just a raw plot with the best fit line of the distribution of income, but we don't see you know, a sort of worrying peak in the distribution below or above the $20,000. So with those in mind, we feel good about proceeding with the regression kink strategy, again, this is a strategy that really benefits with a huge amount of data and one that we're not fortunate to have. As a side note, this company, after we collected these data, they quickly moved to installment loans and then a subsequent type of uh, revolving source of credit. So actually this company no longer offers payday loans. We are stuck with the data that we have, um, which I thought was kind of interesting just in light of the regulatory risk this company got out of the payday business. Finally, we test for the sensitivity of results for alternative choices of bandwidth. So most of our regressions were using the full like $15,000 on either side of the threshold, which is large. And you do see in these results that choosing a bandwidth, you know, an amount of data on either side of the kink, it does make a difference in how, um, in the, the magnitude, um, of our results. So we want to be careful with that, but, uh, you know, we, we feel good about using a, a larger bandwidth given our, um, you know, the paucity of the data that we have. So let me, um, let me give a few final reflections on what we found from this project and more generally on regulating at the margin or maybe financial literacy more general. We find that online payday loan borrowers are highly credit constrained. So they're borrowing more than half of, you know, 57 cents on the dollar of what they're borrowed. And so it suggests that when people need money, they're quite constrained in doing so. And here, I this syncs really nicely, I think, with work that I've done with Neil Buddha at the board. We looked at how do people get in a position that they want to borrow or need to borrow on a payday loan in the first place. And there we found, we can talk a little more about this work in the q and if interested, that people had have had months and years of financial distress leading up to their first interaction with a payday lender. So they had been delinquent on their debt, they had been defaulting, they had been applying for loans and not getting approved. And so at the moment they apply for their first payday loan, they are desperate for $300 for whatever reason, and they have no other options for it. They don't have their credit cards maxed out, et cetera. So um, I think it that lines up nicely with what we found about online payday loan borrowers being um, constrained in their ability to borrow. Second, we show effects on the ability to repay and subsequent borrowing. We think that this constraint of 425 maybe too low and then actually people could benefit in terms of how long they're indebted and how much they're indebted to the payday lender if the state of Tennessee relaxed that cap. So together our results suggest that for low income credit constrained borrowers, a lower, larger loan may alleviate credit problems. At least you know, many, much of this is specific to that $425 cap, but it's not 
you know, Tennessee is pretty typical as far as state guidelines go. Okay, so let me go back to how what I discussed at the beginning of this kind of spectrum of regulating payday loans, mostly at the state level. You know, since the inception of the CFPB, they have talked about payday loans and very little action on payday loans besides some, you know, public enforcement actions. Despite that little action by the CFPB, as I mentioned, there has been a lot of regulatory risk for payday lenders. Many are getting out of the business, but most of the action is at the state level where you know, about half of states have banned payday lending. And I think, I, I, I guess I will say this is misguided because what I see when people are limited in borrowing on payday loans or how much they can borrow is they go to more expensive, more problematic credit products. So. Payday loans are, yes, they're expensive, but they're simple. You know, I don't have to under, understand annualized interest to know that I owe $75 in three weeks to the payday lender or that I owe $40 next week. So that kind of very simple product is unlike installment loans, types of, and imagine a credit card revolving types of credit, so complicated and or um, auto title loans and installment loans have many um, opaque features that I think make them um, worse than payday loans. Many states have implemented price caps, which work you know, essentially just like bans. And I think I mentioned today talking about Chicago and Illinois payday um, interest rates are limited to 33% and just no payday lenders are willing to operate there. Literally the default rates are so high um, that and high annualized interest rates seem to be kind of what the market is driving. So on loan size restrictions, you know, I think that here, you know, I think really what we're trying to think about is suppose we gave everyone who got 425, if they got 500, would that make a difference in their repayment behavior? And I, I think that it might. We also, in a related paper, I've studied uh, at, moral hazard and adverse selection in payday loans. And I also found that larger loans help people to avoid default. So it's kind of opposite of moral hazard. You would think of giving people a larger amount. You might, putting my economist hat on, that might make me think that people would be more likely to default. In fact, it made people much less likely to default. Loan lengths, well, many states are now moving from having, and this is something that's come up in conversations at the federal level as well, you know, increasing the amount of time that people have to repay, that sounds awesome. Easy to do, it mechanically decreases the APR, gives more people more time to sort out their finances. If we require two pay cycles instead of one, I get an extra pay date where I don't have to think about the payday lender, I don't have to pay them anything. In fact, my most recent paper shows this does absolutely nothing except increase the amount of time people are indebted to payday lenders. So it seems that whether it's two weeks or two months, people don't think about repaying until two days before the payday loan is due. And similar with information disclosures here, I think that now I'll put my behavioral economist hat on and think that a lot of the behavior once people do start borrowing, perhaps rationally on payday loans, is driven by self-control problems, uh, time inconsistency and sort of mispredictions about how, how hard it will be to save over time. All the information disclosures or financial literacy, that's not going to, you know, overcome those behavioral biases. Um, so in conclusion and implications, firms are moving online and changing products all the time. As I said, the firm that I'm using data from just totally got out of the payday loan industry. They're now offering a high interest revolving type of credit. Um, you know, payday, payday loans are still widely, wildly popular, but I think they're decreasing and in part because all this little, you know, bit by bit regulation gets lenders scared and, you know, they just kind of move, change products just enough so that they can avoid payday loan regulation. And as I said, they're in huge demand super simple and easy to understand. And that's not true for many kinds of high interest credit. So this firm has now moved to flex loans. Just as I was preparing this talk, I saw a bus drive by 
my work that said, come borrow on a flex loan. It's not a payday loan. It's a line of credit. I don't know how it works. It's some complicated thing, but I think this is exactly the evidence that points to me saying alternatives to payday loans are often worse. This is some kind of high interest credit card revolving that, you know, who knows what the terms are and people are just sort of indefinitely indebted to um, this company with that. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Uh, I have a few other slides, but I'd love to hear some more comments and feedback and questions. So um, I think I'll stop my presentation there and see what you guys have to say. Thank you, Christine. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. This has been very interesting. Um, so one question is that you find um, your estimates of Pell Credit constrained borrowers are higher than other studies. So do you think that's something particular about this setting or, you know, the, the group that you're studying, or is it something that the, the rest of the literature is missing here? Well, I think it's, uh, I don't know that the rest of the literature is missing. I mean, they're all in different domains, right? So the papers I cited were on credit cards, auto title loans, storefront payday loans, and uh, people close to maxing out their credit cards. So I think, um, and you know, we are all doing the sort of same exercise of looking at what the offer curve is theoretically and looking at how much people borrow for every dollar offered. So I'd say, I mean, I feel pretty confident these are the uh, most credit constrained group out there. Mm -hmm. And and how does that um, how do you think that interacts with the fact that to be to to get a payday loan you know you do have to have a paycheck and you have to have some sort of income and you need a bank account and so maybe you're not in some of the worst off um, group of uh, group of individuals yeah that's a great question I mean maybe I should pull back a little bit and say these aren't the most credit constrained but maybe I mean the people. It's true that you have to have a bank account, you have to have a job or at least unemployment <laughs> benefits. Um, although we're looking at very low income people, you know, around $20,000. You know, my other work is on pawn shop borrowers who don't have maybe any of those things. You needn't have a job, you don't have a, have a banking account or a checking account. So, um, and there, yeah, I guess we just, we don't have estimates on uh, the liquidity constraints of, pawn shop borrowers, that might be something that I could do, but I think, um, yeah, these are, in some sense, I think the payday loan group is, people borrowing on payday loans are the ones that are really affected by, like, you know, we were talking today about tax policy for low-income earners, child tax credit, people who are actually filing their taxes, earning income. So, you know, I think I guess I find it sort of neither here nor there who's the most constrained, but that this group is really interested in a huge swath of, you know, American middle class. Definitely. Um, so do you, do you think your results, uh, sorry, let me reframe the question. Um, do you have evidence, are these loans producing like financial stress for for people broadly in the in the short term or the long term? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, here I've shown, I kind of intimated that, that saying these loans, capping the loans might be bad because people are borrowing more once they're constrained. Again, I'll refer back to work I did with Neil Buddha at the board where we matched payday loan borrowers or applicants to their credit reports. And what we found, you know, again, we found people had all kinds of financial problems leading up to their payday loan, but also that after their payday loan, we didn't really see much. There wasn't, you know, we didn't see big consequences financially to people. And I think part of that was because people had, you know, they had already experienced the worst of financial outcomes that one $300 loan, already your credit score is 500 or 520. Already you can't get a loan. So it's like, how else can we observe um, you know, what other data can we look at to see how people are doing? And maybe these data we were talking earlier on just overall financial well-being or self-reported happiness, how, you know, how easy could, how easily could you, you know, make ends meet, those kinds of questions and data and survey and qualitative might be um, better attuned to 
answering these questions because we can look at all the financial things you want, but at the end of the day, people are either, they go home from work and they're either miserable about their finances or they feel good about it. So that's not something I can, you know, quantify with what I see. Yeah, it's a little harder to uh, to have that in a data set. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I found the, um, the data set that you use in the paper and kind of using this uh, this data set from a, from a lender to be really interesting and really important, you know, in this space particularly to be able to kind of get inside the, the operations of what's happening. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your your process to get access to this type of data, or or why a lender might have an incentive to provide a researcher, or, or any advice you have for researchers that are interested in kind of getting access to some of some of the interesting data sets like this? Yeah, so I, this came up earlier in one of my conversations. This, um, the short version of these data is that these days payday lenders come to me and they say, Paige, do you want to look at our data, which is totally weird. But what I did when I was a grad student, this was in 2003, 2004, is I, I got interested in pawn shops and payday loans. I sent letters to every single hundreds and hundreds of pawn shop companies and payday lenders. And many of them are publicly traded big companies. And I happened to get find one executive who thought, here's this grad student. She's doing, you know, legitimate science, social science work. Our, you know, our reputation as payday lenders is so bad. What harm could Paige do to our industry if we get her data and let her write her dissertation on payday loans? So they really had nothing to lose. And um, so they let me, uh, gave me access to, this was a company in Texas, gave me access to their records. So the lesson from that was just, that was a lot of legwork and something I don't think I would have um, the motivation to do 20 years later, but it really paid off because having written a handful of papers where I'm very, you know, I'm sort of agnostic about are payday loans good or bad, and I came out as almost payday loan cheerleader, but really I'm saying is that what the alternatives to payday loans are a lot worse, and I do that in a, you know, I think a legitimate social scientific way. Um, so these days I've just I've, you know, I've got connections in the credit world and was introduced um, to this lender who works in Tennessee. And so um, just a lot of elbow grease and, you know, writing what I think are sometimes kind of boring rote papers about an industry that gets such bad credit, bad, you know, reputation. People thought she's a legitimate researcher. Let's let her take a hand at analyzing our data. But they really, they don't get much out of it. I don't think that my work per se has particularly influenced the payday lending space or whatnot, so. Well, I think we've all been able to learn a lot from your work. And so I'm glad <laughs> well, that- I find it fascinating. I, I hope it has <laughs> helped, but I don't think I've, you know, the if the worry is I would somehow write something that would change the regulation of payday loans, I don't. I don't know that I'm that confident about the work I'm doing is having such a big influence, but who knows? So um, along a similar vein, so this work has interesting policy implications as, as you discussed. Do you have any particular policy, policy recommendations um, that you think come out of this paper? Yeah, so out of this paper and then like more broadly, I mean, this paper is sort of nested in the you know dozen papers I've written on payday loans. I do think that regulating credit markets so often people think very narrowly like oh 400 percent APR that's terrible we have to get rid of that but they don't think more broadly about what the spillover effects are of taking away one type of loan or restricting you know restricting access to it. So I think more broadly about the overall you know financial conditions of borrowers. If people need $300, they're going to get it somewhere. Might be the payday lender, might be their mom, could be a loan shark, could be installment loan. You know, these all have different welfare effects. Um, and second, I guess, you know, what I've mostly been interested is I kind of said in offhand that people are in such bad financial situation when they go to the payday loan that that's like the worst of their problems. But 
that is very interesting to me as a broader questions about how people get in this situation. And I think that's a really nested mosaic of low wages, high cost of education, high cost of living, um, po different sorts of poverty traps. So um, those are really difficult questions, but I just, I guess coming out of this paper per se, I would urge, you know, whether it's, you know, any kind of, you know, people at the CFPB or local Tennessee regulators, like think about what the consequences of these actions are going to be when you restrict types of lending, because when people need money, they will find a way to do it. And to go back uh, a little bit to dive back into some of your results. So, um, the, you know, the magnitude of this estimate of future borrowing needs for people is pretty, it seems pretty large. Can you give us some intuition for kind of for the size of that, um, the size yeah. of that and, and well, first oh, of all, just, say, just relatedly, I was thinking, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> well, just one thought on that is that, you know, we find being constrained around 50, you know, suppose difference between what would have been a $450 loan and a $425 loan leads to essentially like two more payday loans. So think of that as like, maybe like rolling, we don't find this on like rollovers, but thinking about having to interact with the payday lender a couple more times, two more of those $300 loans, but the effects are very large, like surprisingly large. So it's something we really have to think about. And, you know, we will, I haven't had a chance to do it, but we, I just aggregate all of those types of loans, installment loans, auto title loans, payday loans into one number. So I want to unpack that and see what are like the more precise mechanisms through which this one online payday loan feeds into those other types of credit. And then one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about the CFPB work is I, I have some recollection that, you know, they find in the data that most people roll over their loan once or once or twice. Um, but then there, you know, it's, it's heavily skewed and there's, you know, maybe it may be 10%, 5% of the people roll yeah. over like 10 times or yeah, more or something. I think that's right. so, you know, for, that, for that group. So do you see something similar in your data? And, and do you think that, you know, which, which part of the, this population of payday lenders might be driving your results? Yeah, so, I mean, it is true, it's very skewed, but I think like the mode and the need is mean, I mean, most people, I think roll over their payday loan two or three times. Like it's very atypical to take a payday loan and repay it for the, you know, paid off on the first time. And, you know, that's more emblematic of like a problem with the industry is that it's built on the income the revenue from these um, rollovers. So um, I think, I guess, I don't know if I, I'd have to go back and look. I don't remember off the top of my head the precise numbers on what my sample looks like as far as rolling over, but I'm quite certain it's pretty, I think it's pretty universal that rolling over is um, very common. It would be interesting to look at if there's a subset of these there must be some of my borrowers who are like one and done and repay this loan. Um, or some, you know, some of our close to the max borrowers, they're taking out 10 more, you know, a thousand dollars more in a year. So that's going to be a couple of payday loans and an installment loan. So there it's, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I have to think more about the heterogeneity and I don't know off the top of my head exactly what the breakdown of rollovers looks like. Okay. I just have one more question and then I'll turn it over to Andrea to, uh, to wrap up. Um, so, so in general, thinking about the, con you know, as, pol as, a, as a, someone at a policy uh, based institution, I've worked in other policy institutions, um, looking at the household finance, kind of the household financial landscape in general, what are the main areas that you think warrant kind of policy attention uh, currently, you know, either in the payday space or just, just very broadly? Yeah, I mean, I think as of now, like payday loans seem kind of old school to me. There's always this, firms are moving and inventing and new things. So right now, you know, I'd say the closest um, alternative to payday loans are these early wage advances. So like Walmart has one called even, I believe, where you can get your pay that same day instead of having to week, wait a week or two weeks. 
And those are essentially like payday loans. It's just done on your phone. Um, also, uh, you know, buy now, pay later, all these kind of online and I guess I call it like fringe tech or fintech technology. Um, you know, despite that, I think people love to like go into a payday loan app. Like I'm just sticking with storefront online kind of traditional stuff rather than the high tech. But um, I would say those kind of um, newer technologies, but also I know that student loans are a huge, this is kind of putting my bankruptcy hat on. I teach bankruptcy in the law school and student loans are on the forefront of so many policymakers' minds and of legal scholars and students and former students. So, you know, if I was gonna put an energy into something new, I think it would be both trying to understand how we can bring the cost of higher education down or change the norms into who goes into higher education, but also, how do we handle those loans on the back end when it can be so crippling to families? Thank okay, so well, thank you so much. Um, I'll turn it to Andrea. Perfect, thank you, Christine, and thank you, Paige. This was a fascinating presentation. And actually, I have one more question, if I may. Oh, ask. yeah, of course. <laughs> so I recently, or no, actually, a few years ago, I started with some research on a nationally representative sample that I have. And I looked into alternative financial services use and the age distribution. And I know you have age, too, because you said you have the driver's license. So did you look, are the borrowers predominantly younger? Or what? do you have any information? Yeah, so most at this company, most um, most payday loan borrowers are like in their 30s. But in mm -hmm. our sample, the monthly borrowers tend to be a little bit older. And then the weekly borrowers are a little younger. And the lower income borrowers are the younger ones making very much minimum wage. But it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of skewed towards a little older than you would think. So these aren't like mm -hmm. teenagers, 20 something. It's more like 30 in the 30s to 40. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, a, in my sample, I mean, because it was a survey, they were all 18 plus, but uh, we really found um, that the younger are more predominant to use alternative financial services compared with older yeah. cohorts. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I see we have two minutes left. I just would like to thank you for the fascinating presentation and to thank everybody who joined us today for their participation and for the, for, for the questions we got. Um, this actually, your presentation wraps up our spring semester. So thank you. And I see Anna is just joining us as well. <laughs> so- um, Hi, thank you everyone. Thank you, Anna, Anna and uh, Andrea. This has been a lot of fun to get feedback and to get my paper together to present. So thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I just would like to wrap up um, and really say, uh, um, please stay tuned for our fall schedule. So we will come out this summer. We are very grateful to work together um, with the Fed board on this series. So we are looking forward to the speakers and the presentations in the fall. And um, with, with that, I just want to thank everybody for participation and um, wish everyone a great summer. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks okay, for the thank seminar. You. And uh, see you next term. We will have a great list of candidates. And uh, thank you, um, Paige, for ending our seminar with, uh, uh, you know, with this great day. Thank you everyone from both institutions. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.